There is great interest and anticipation when coming into what has been described as one of the greatest engineering feats ever undertaken. Vessels approaching the canal from the Atlantic pick up a pilot and follow a marked channel to arrive at the Gatun Locks. First sight of this massive concrete structure is impressive. Ships are guided through the locks by electric locomotives, known as mules. They were named after the animals traditionally used to pull barges. Forward motion into and through the locks is actually provided by the ship's engines. The mules provide braking control. Ships approaching the locks first pull up to the guide wall where lines are cast for the mules to take control. Large ships are precisely controlled by two mules on each side at the bow and two at each side at the stern. The mules themselves run on a rack track to which they are geared. Each has a powerful winch but can play cables in and out to keep the ship centered in the lock. With as little as two feet of space on each side of a ship, considerable skill is required on the part of the operators. The Gatun locks are essentially three large steps, consisting of six chambers, three side by side. Together they raise and lower ships 85 feet, which is the full canal height above sea level. The twin chambers enable two ships to enter together, or one can enter as the other exits the canal. The lifting and lowering of ships is simply accomplished through gravity. The level in the chamber is raised by allowing the water to flow in from the lake above or lowered by letting it flow out to the channel below. The lock chambers are 110 feet wide and 1,050 feet long. This determines the size of the ship that can pass through them. Most of the seagoing ships being built today are governed by the limiting size of the locks. When passage is completed through the locks, ships enter Gatun Lake. Gatun Lake is one of the largest artificial lakes in the world. The lake was created by the damming of the Chagres River. The waters of the lake fill the canal and provide a reservoir of water as much as lost to the sea each time a ship passes through the locks. The channel followed by ships across the lake is 32 miles in length. This represents more than one half of the distance that ships will travel through the canal. Cutting this waterway through this narrow strip of land has meant that it is no longer necessary to sail around the entire continent of South America. As much as 8,000 nautical miles can be saved, which represents huge savings in time and fuel. The advantage of the shortcut between the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans was first recognized by the Spanish explorer Balboa, who was the first European to cross the isthmus and view the Pacific Ocean in 1513. Over the years, many have dreamed of digging a canal. It was not until 1880 that a serious attempt was made by a French company. They undertook to cut a canal at sea level through the isthmus. They were under-equipped and under-financed and overwhelmed by the loss of 20,000 workers who died due to yellow fever and malaria. After 10 years of heartbreaking effort, the project was abandoned. The then President of the United States, Theodore Roosevelt, recognized the strategic and economic value of the canal. Under his strong leadership, America took hold of the project in 1904. It was recognized at the outset that nothing could be accomplished without controlling the mosquitoes that carry the diseases that could cripple the entire workforce. 
Following a long and expensive campaign, the mosquito problem was brought under control and work on the canal could proceed. The greatest challenge in the renewed effort was the excavation of the Culebra Cut. This was the digging of a huge trench nine miles in length through the very center of the Continental Divide. As many as 6,000 men worked on the cut at a time. Adding to their difficulties were the torrential downpours and the extreme heat. It was a colossal undertaking. Tons of explosives were used to tear out a valley one-third of a mile wide. Frequent and unexpected landslides resulted in this artificial valley becoming three times wider than originally planned. Over 200 million cubic yards of earth and rock had to be hauled away and dumped. Much of the fill was used to build islands, breakwaters, and the land for the new town of Balboa. Work was also progressing on the canal locks. It was a huge construction project on a scale never seen before. The building of the locks required millions of tons of concrete. Everything was gargantuan in size, including the immense lock gates. In 1914, at the end of ten years of dogged perseverance and brilliant engineering, the Panama Canal was completed. The waters of Lake Gatun were allowed to flow through the canal. It was a great occasion when the first ship ceremoniously sailed from sea to sea. Today there is a constant procession of ships in transit. The importance of the Panama Canal to world trade is clearly evident as over 12,000 ships registered to 70 countries now pass through this canal each year. Sailing through it, it is difficult to grasp that this waterway is man-made. The tiered banks along the canal, however, are a testimony to the colossal effort that went into cutting through this unforgiving land. It is a land that continues to fight back as landslides regularly occur within the canal. From the very beginning, dredging has been necessary to maintain the desired channel depth. Extensive work is currently underway as a part of a huge project to build new locks and widen the canal. This will give access to today's super tankers and large cargo vessels. As Gold Hill comes into view, it stands as a monument to the seemingly never-ending battle that went into digging through the middle of the Continental Divide. Gold Hill was the highest peak to be conquered. It stood at 662 feet above sea level and took over 60 million pounds of dynamite to tear it and the facing hill apart to allow the canal to flow between them. In later years this enormous ditch was widened further to enable larger ships to pass each other. At the end of the Culebra Cut, ships enter the single Pedro Miguel Lock and begin their descent toward the Pacific Ocean. Ships in this lock are lowered 31 feet to the level of the Miloflores Lake Throughout its history, the canal has been profitable. Tolls charged are based on the type of vessel, the size of the ship, and the cargo it is carrying. The toll for cruise ships is based on the number of passengers carried. A cruise ship recently paid a toll of $342,000, a new record for the canal. Soon after crossing a small artificial lake, Transiting ships enter the Miloflores Locks, which takes them down two more steps to the level of the Pacific Ocean. The size of these locks is impressive, stretching over a mile in length. They are the tallest of the three, which is due to the extreme tidal variations on this side of the isthmus. When the canal locks were built, two million cubic yards of concrete were required. This was the largest concrete pour ever recorded at that time. 
No steel reinforcing bars were used. The aggregate in the concrete is granite, one to three inches in diameter. The concrete is so hard that ships that hit or bump it come off a loser. This is one of the many reasons that the Panama Canal has stood up so well for almost a hundred years. In 1999, the USA gave control of the canal to the Panamanian government. The treaty guarantees that the canal will allow all ships of all nations to use it even in times of war. Under new ownership, the canal continues to enjoy great success. It remains a vital link in world trade carrying more cargo than ever before. The improvements to the canal are well underway and this bodes well for a continuation of the Panama Canal's remarkable history, one of the wonders of the modern world. <music>